Oh, okay. Um, Hello, everyone. Welcome to the past and present performance series. Uh, we know this is not the past and present performance series anymore. It's the New Jersey Governor's Awards in Arts Education Presents. Today, we are with Molly Johnson. So can you please introduce yourself and tell us what you won the Governor's Award for? Oh, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Molly Gaston Johnson, and I won the New Jersey Governor's Award this year, but I also won it, I think it was five years ago, um, both times for being a teaching artist. So for outstanding teaching artist. I had no idea that you could win it twice. <laughs> I didn't know either. I was, I was very honored, um, honestly, very honored and pleasantly surprised. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine. Yeah. <laughs> so um, we're going to be doing a couple of questions and then she has um, a PowerPoint set up for us, which is really exciting. So um, what did winning a governor's award mean to you? And you can talk about both experiences. Thank you. Uh, so winning the governor's award in general, it's just such a reflection of honor because I know I've been, you know, working as a visual artist and now a teaching artist also for a number of years. And so to win an award where I get nominated, um, so like, and the first time I, I won this award, I didn't even know the award existed. And so to be nominated by your peers, who I would have the utter, utmost respect for all of the people I work with, who are my fellow teaching artists and also arts administrators and um, people who run foundations, all of these people, I have such deep respect for the work that they do. And so to be nominated by them because they think that I am doing a good job, it, it's just, to me, it's like the best type of award you can get. Um, it's quite an honor. <laughs> That's awesome. That's a really interesting way of looking at it, like, obviously, but it's, um, that's really awesome. And that it's similar to how, like, what in the Academy, in theory, elects their, uh, the awards, it's, it's the same, it's people who have done the job saying, you're doing this job really well. Yeah. And, and like, um, it's a little embarrassing to admit that the first time I didn't even know the award existed, but that's because I had my nose to the books all the time, like doing my work. And maybe that's part of the reason why I got recognized. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome. I didn't know it existed either. And then you realize how absolutely like, like important it is and how statewide it is. And it's just really exciting. Yes. And the, and the other thing I should tell everybody, if they don't already know this, is that Jocelyn, you've also won it this year, correct? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I won for a uh, film. And that's awesome. And so like it, it, the other great thing that I love about this award is that it recognizes people at many different stages of their career. Because I'm, I've been around a while <laughs> and it looks like you're kind of young. <laughs> Wait, what, you've been around for for how long? Five years? Because it, it looks like you can't possibly be over twenty. You're the best. This is why they put you on. <laughs> this is very good at what you do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um. So moving back to the questions, um, and and past the flattery, though it is absolutely accurate. <laughs> um. Why do you believe the arts are very important? Ah. So you gave me these questions already. And, and when I saw them, I'm like, I know, I know how I feel about these things. But here I am, and I feel like gobsmacked. And I think it's because I'm excited. And um, I feel like I'm not sure who I'm reaching because I'm looking at one other face. But hopefully there's lots of people listening now or maybe that we'll listen to later. And I think the arts are so important because of the way that the arts reach lots of types of people that think differently than what sometimes the world wants us to think. Like the arts offer um, a way to take in what we learn from experience from the world, but then to present it in a different way. And sometimes we're able to present it in a way that makes other people who see what we do see the world a little bit differently. And sometimes we're able 
to make that situation result in some kind of either positive change, maybe on a tiny scale or maybe on a big scale. So that's that's why I think art is important. And to me, it doesn't matter what kind of art it is. Um, I personally am a visual artist, um, but I understand the same can happen through written work um, or dance or film or singing. Um, so I love art for the way that, number one, it can be an escape from a world that can be very stressful. But number two, it can also present our stressful world in a way that helps us get beyond stress and into a place of processing or action or feeling like we're in a better place because of it. I agree. There's something very therapeutic about film. I'm not film, well, film for me, but it, for art for you and for, for everyone, there's something very therapeutic about art in general. Mm -hmm. Um, also, for everyone who just joined in from Facebook, um, it, there was a little bit of a delay, but we are with Molly Gaston Johnson, and she answered basically about um, just who she was and what uh, she won the award for. And the entire stream up to now is on YouTube, but if you'd like to do a little bit of a recap for people who just joined in, that would be okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yes, thank you. I I have won the New Jersey Governor's Award this year for being an outstanding teaching artist, but I did also win it for the same thing. I wish I had the date, like I can't think of, but it was about five or six years ago. And um, so it's it's been an amazing honor and uh, I'm humbled because I know that the award comes from a group of people that I have such respect for. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so um, skipping to the next question, what impact did arts education have on your life? And so you've been in arts for a really long time and you've been a teaching artist for a while. And so I'd like to hear about what it was like when you were a student and then also when you were a teacher and when you are a teacher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a very vivid memory from elementary school um, I was, I was, okay, so I'm going to tell you, I can't speak without telling the whole world about my life story because <laughs> that's just who I am. But like as a kid, I lived in a, you know, a nice little suburban neighborhood in Ohio, but my family ha was like not your typical family. My mother and father were divorced and then my mother got cancer and she passed away when I was still only in sixth grade. But with all of that turmoil, and because my family lived in a place that seemed kind of perfect, you know, um, and then I saw that my own family was kind of different from everybody else's. But I remember a bunch of things that were art related. Um, one of them was that, uh, in my head, my childhood was fantastic. I mean, despite that I was sad that my mother passed away, really sad. But, um, you know, my dad, left when I was very young, but like, I, I didn't feel like I was missing a thing. I felt like I was always drawing. Um, I also at a younger age was more theatrical and my friends and I would put on weird little plays in our garages. And um, it was just the way we played. You know, I, I grew up before there were video um, devices that we all had personally, we could go to the arcade. But um, <laughs> so art was like a way for me to really like, everything was okay. But then also in elementary school, I don't remember what grade, maybe third grade, I was singled out with a few other kids in my grade to work with a visiting artist who happened to be an architect. And I remember we walked around the school with tape measures and we measured hallways and walls and we made a scale version of our elementary school. And that that memory like stuck with me. And so then jump ahead to now where I actually get to be a person visiting schools. I really I'm like so grateful. And that that memory had stuck with me before I even knew that I would become a teaching artist. It was it was like it's those things which hit you like differently throughout your life. And, and it's and it's. I love when I love hearing stories like that when it's a full circle and it's like I this extraordinary thing happened for me and now I can do the same thing for other children or other people and it's just really really exciting to hear that. 
Yeah. Like it made me feel special and I felt really cool measuring things. And I'm like, oh, even if that's all a kid gets, that's, that might be enough, you know? <laughs> and that reminds me a little bit of um, Mr. Rogers' philosophy on everything where it's you're special and it's that, that philosophy that he, he bestows. I think that's a really good one. And you seem yeah. to embody that as well. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. That's another good crowd to be a part of. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so what words of wisdom do you have for young artists? Okay. So I put together a PowerPoint. I'm not sure if this is the place to reveal it because Jocelyn, you haven't seen it. I tried to send it to you last night and it was too big. Um, but my, my words of advice to young people, are you talking about advice about if they want to go into the arts or just what do you, what so, do you so really it can be about anything. The question originally when we had the past and present performance series was advice to the class of 2020, whether it be the graduating from high school or graduating from college and that I, I viewed as topical now, but now we're on to the new school year. So it would end up. 2021, but I think just young artists in general is important. And I think, you know, every child is an artist, but specifically ones that um, are planning to go into an artistic field, I think would, would like your advice. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> I really, I personally, you'll see when I show the PowerPoint, but I am extremely diverse in my career as an artist. So I, right now I get this award for being a teaching artist, but what most people don't know is that I'm a sign painter. I'm a framer of art. Uh, currently, I do both of these things in addition to being a teaching artist. I also have a studio where I make my own art, which I sell sometimes when people want it and often enough that it's worth it. And I, not long ago, about five years ago, started a um, portrait business like and literally it was me talking to this woman who owns the gallery where I am now a framer which is great because being a teaching artist you're not working every day of the week you know so it's a way to supplement um, my income but I, I talked to her I'm like you know I'm pretty good at drawing what if I uh, sat at your gallery every Saturday and offered to draw people's pets and she's like, sure, because she was new with this business and she gave me this opportunity. And I literally would sit on the street like there's a photograph of me from Manasquan sitting on the street. I almost look like I'm a homeless person, which is not funny, but like I was willing to do anything because I love I really love what I do. And so sign painter, framer, um, you know, and I, and I did go to get my master. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts and I went on to get my Master of Fine Arts. I double majored in art history, which now um, part of what I do as a teacher is I'm an adjunct professor at some of the local universities near where I live and I teach art history. I have worked in museums. I worked for the National Endowment for the Arts before I had children. Um, and that was, you know, a federal government job. I was in DC. That was when Bill Clinton was president. Um, that was a fascinating job. Like, the more you can learn, the more you will be able to do because there's a lot of things that go into the arts, in quotes. You can see my quotes. Um, there's not just the person who makes the art, but there's all the group of people that help to provide opportunities for artists or or they maybe own the building where a performance gets to happen and they choose who's coming and who's not going to be allowed to perform. I mean, there's so much that diversify and learn. Like artists are, people have this image of the artist as, oh, you know, like flighty or airheaded, but I totally disagree with that. And I think that just like pursuing anything that interests you and not you know, stick all the pokers in the fire. Some of them will catch and get hot and you'll go in those directions, but maybe all of them will catch and get hot. And I feel like that's kind of what happened to me, which I, I really like. <laughs> that's really cool. That's, I know you mentioned to me that you have a lot of experience in a lot of different places, but that, that makes you so much, well, I think it would make you even a better teacher because it showed like you, 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 understand every kid's passion you know yeah 
like like if a kid comes up to you like I like film and another kid comes up to you like I like playing an instrument I like I like drawing pictures you'll understand each of where they're coming from and that would develop a deeper connection I do think it's helpful uh, for me to relate to the kids that I come across in my teaching and even the kids who maybe like because I work with a lot of kids who say oh I can't draw and because I'm a visual artist it's not that we're always drawing but we're always doing something of visual art maybe collage or maybe a print project but um, a lot of kids don't love that and I get it and I'm like it's okay but just give it a try you'll learn something and you might end up working in a museum where you get to curate the show of this kind of artwork if you like what this is so again diversify and stay open like if you like film then you can be a film historian if you can't make if you if you don't have the drive to make films and like you can be an art historian if you don't have the drive to create the art mm -hmm. and and that's something i think about a lot when when i'm in my my grade is that students they are so they're like oh i don't know what to do and then they like this thing but they aren't sure they'll be able to create it. I'm like, there's so many other layers that you can do involving it. And you just have to think about what you enjoy as from a bit, deconstruct your enjoyment, I guess, in a way. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so two more questions, and then we can get on to your awesome presentation, which I'm really excited for, because okay. normally <laughs> I um, I see what is like gonna be presented beforehand, but I trusted that you were gonna, you were gonna have a good thing, and we just, you know how it is sometimes. Technological yeah. issues. Yes. <laughs> um, so share something from your career that you are proud of. Oh, that's an interesting question because my because my career is so varied. Um, I it's like pick one aspect of the career. Like i I'm proud of a lot of things I've done in all of those different fields, but I think the parts that I am most proud of are a couple of occasions where through my work as a visual artist and because I have my studio and because for years I had run things for the community out of my studio. So um, I don't really teach out of my studio. It's truly where I make my art, but I did have a on group going critique group. And so people came in and they brought their artwork and we would sit around and help each other out. Like say, oh, you know, this is interesting. That part over there looks a little strange. What's that all about? Um, but because for years I had been doing that and sort of had become just by offering it up for, for free, really, a, a community artist, I had opportunities um, to write grants for my own art projects. And writing a grant for an idea that you have is a way to get money to support something that's bigger than you could do on your own budget. Um, and, and here's another way that being diverse is good because I, I knew about these grants because of my work at the National Endowment for the Arts and at museums. But anyway, so when I had left those jobs and was just truly a practicing artist, um, there were a couple of opportunities that came my way because people already knew me. And, and so they said, hey, I heard about this grant um, and I think what you do might really fit well. So I read the proposal and I submitted my idea and I got selected for two projects, which, I, which were really good. And um, they centered around recovery from um, Superstorm Sandy was one of the things. And, th and that also led to other jobs where I actually created for some of the community centers around here, they happened to be churches, but I was able to make a new altars for two churches. And so that was kind of amazing to um, create something that is that important to some people, like the idea of a church altar. Um, so those are, those are a couple things I'm really proud of. Absolutely. Um, that, that adds a whole other level of, of importance. It's, it's, it's the, um, the theological and the artistic. That's really interesting. Yeah. And, and because I teach art history, that overlap happens a lot, you know, and there's just so many things. I, I don't know if there are a lot of other artists that do as much as what I do diverse in diverse ways like that, but 
you can either go deep on one thing or or kind of like enjoy a lot of things and i guess i've taken the route of spreading a wide net but it's let me do some really interesting projects along the way which is awesome and i think that gives you such an interesting path mm -hmm. so our last question leads into your presentation the question is what inspires you during this time so before you answer that um do you want me on the screen during your presentation or no? I would love you to be on the screen and okay. to ask me questions. I am a big fan of like interaction. And so <laughs> the more I can see someone's face and interact, the better. <laughs> Absolutely. I just always ask to make sure that everyone feels comfortable. Yeah. So let's, let's get this going. Um, what inspires you the most during this time? Okay, so here, here is like to part B of that question of what are you most proud of? Um, one of the other opportunities that I was able to, to make happen, which I'm very proud of, is um, very much related to this COVID reality, um, which I'm not a big fan of, of having to clamp down. And, and then like shortly after we all were forced to stay in our homes, we maybe with more consciousness because we had less distraction we became acutely aware hopefully acutely aware of of the awful ways that people are treated um and i'm talking mostly about black people and and so like all of these things have hit us very obviously um recently although they are not new things you know these things have been around a long time um but early on when businesses were closing down and schools were closing down i had just come back from a trip out west which related to the to another grant that i was able to get um working on a big project last summer and so i was i had gone out there to see the exhibit and i was coming home fresh off of that experience but nervous because i was flying home when everything was beginning to shut down and so i was scared i wouldn't get home all of that so I had landed, I had gotten home okay, and I had this idea that um, I could, because of the people I had met out West and because of people that I knew here who knew who I was, I'm like, you know what, let's start a digital community mural. And, and we based it off of an idea that had related to the grant I had done last, or the project I had done last summer, which was called Exquisite Gorge, which is had artists going out to the Columbia River in Washington State to create a woodblock print that was 60 feet long. Big story. I won't get into it. You'll see a picture of it. Um, but so I came home. And I'm like, you know what? We could do a digital exquisitely connected project. So it's called Exquisitely Connected. It's based off of a surrealist game. So it's my art history experience. You know, the surrealists, um, they would sit around and play this game where they one person would draw a picture and then hide what they drew and let someone else continue from a few lines that extended into it. So you unfold the paper at the end and you get this wacky drawing. Um, so exquisitely connected kind of plays off that idea. And it's a way that all of us who were now stuck in our homes, we could communicate something. And again, back to the therapy idea, art can be therapeutic. I felt it would be very important to let people have a way to express themselves and to feel like they could still be connected. And in kind of a weirdly beautiful way, all of a sudden we were becoming connected to people in anywhere in the country, um, which you could have done before, but I think the, the reality of the way we were living and the way this project was designed was to specifically call that to attention. So I'm very proud of that. And it really inspires me in this current time, which is crazy because we have gotten people expressing ideas about COVID, but also um, injustice. And, and it's all knitted together in this digital mural that anyone can see at any time of day, even though we can't go to museums so easily anymore. Yeah, it like I I like what you said where it said where you said you could be connected across the country uh, before, but now it's it's more of like um oh of course we can you know it, it was it was more of like um it became more poignant to be connected across 
across the country during uh, coronavirus. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know Teresa. So, okay. <laughs> um, so, would you like to set up the uh, slides? Yes. Now, I'm not a big pro at this. I hope. Okay, so it's already on, right? So I just um, bring it up. Am I sharing? Yes. So you okay. just bring it up. There we go. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to go from beginning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So does this look big for everybody? Yeah, like, perfect. Okay. perfect. And I'm glad I can hear your voice. And if people ask questions, I would love to respond to people's questions. Yes. Everybody in the audience, please ask questions. We will put them on the screen for the answer. Yes. So here is, I only have about six slides, but I wanted you to, even when I'm teaching an art history class, even though it's about artwork that is in a history book, which mine is not, not yet anyway, um, I like to show my own artwork. I feel like it tells people a little bit about who I am. So I wanted to do the same here. Um, so this set of slides is about not just my own artwork, but about community projects I've done and also some teaching artist work I've done. So I've got kind of a slide that batches together all of that. Um, and we've already talked about this part. This is a reminder to all of you looking that um, be diverse. That has been a great success to me. It has allowed me to pursue my genuine love of art that I have had since I was a kid drawing with my crayons in my little house in Ohio or measuring the walls of my school with that architect. Um, like I have always loved art. And so by my own drive and my own curiosity with at just about anything I can think of related to art, I have allowed, I have given myself this great gift of always having a job that is somehow related to art. Even if I'm not always making it, sometimes I've been supporting others to make their work, but it's fascinating. And through that, I've learned a lot um, that has inspired my own art. So be diverse. This talks a little bit about the thousands of jobs that I've had. <laughs> I joke that I am um, like I will do anything when it comes to art, sort of, almost. Uh, so now I'm going to go to the next slide, I think. Yay, that worked. <laughs> but that's a passion that a lot of people don't have. Like. I've talked to people and they're like, I don't really know what makes me happy. And I think I think both of us were, were struck and we're blessed with that we found this thing that we love so much. And every artist was blessed with that. I, yeah, that's a good point. Um, such a good point, Jocelyn. <laughs> I'm sorry, what else were you gonna say? No, 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 that, that's pretty much it. I was just saying that we're, we're blessed and everyone who is watching and everyone who is doing art um, is blessed to have that ability and blessed to have that passion because it's it's surprisingly rare. Yeah, and and you know what else? Um, I have to be thankful to my parents, even though I told the the story at the beginning about how my mother and father divorced when I was really young. Um, and so I hardly knew my dad as a young, young kid. But then when my mother passed away, I ended up having to move in where he was living. And that was very weird for me. But at the same time, he too, both my mother and my father in their own separate ways, allowed me to pursue my art. They never said, oh, you're never going to make a living. Oh, you're never blah, blah, blah. And I never even thought about making a living, honestly. I just um, loved it and went for it. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. I love that passion. That's something I hear a lot too, is that it's like, oh, I want to do this, like that, that question where it's, what would you do if, if money didn't matter? And people always like, there's, it's very rarely people say what they are going into. So like rarely do people say like they wanted to be a doctor and then they say, oh yeah, I wanted to be a doctor or, or they say like, oh, I wanted to be a financial advisor. And then they say, oh yeah, I want to be a financial advisor. Like they make the decision based on money, not based on passion. Mm -hmm. And then there's like people like you and me who it's like, we just kind of want money to stay alive. And as long as we're alive, then we can do what we're meant to do. I agree. And to me having, 
I think of it as having my soapbox. That might be an old expression that you don't understand this uh, young people who are listening, having either my soapbox or my microphone to be able to speak out. And for me, speaking out means making visual art, but I put it in a gallery and I know that I'm getting people to think. And that's important to me. And I think if all of a sudden I couldn't do that anymore, mm, my life would not feel purposeful. Uh, so that would be tough. I, and I've never had to deal with that, luckily, because I always have found a way to earn a living through some way in the arts. Um, and money is important. There's no doubt about it. But at the same time, don't let people discourage you. If you love this, um, you just go for it because someone's going to do it. So why not you? Right. <laughs> so you're looking here at a batch of my own artwork that I do outside of anybody telling me what they want and outside of any teaching. Um, I was I studied printmaking at James Madison in Virginia, and I loved it so much that I ended up, I, I also at James Madison, I discovered that I loved art history. So I double majored and then um, took a year in between that and graduate school because I, I really wasn't sure which one I wanted to study more. Um, and I ended up remembering all those stories from my childhood. I'm like, I have to keep going with visual art. So I, I got a master's in fine art as well. And printmaking was my concentration. And that just means that I, I have lots of techniques that I know how to do to make images from either like a wood block that I've carved or a intaglio plate that I've etched or a silk screen. And, and I really love the way I use it now as an adult. Um, as a young person, I was all caught up in making editions where everything looked the same in the same edition. And now I just use the techniques and I really love the joy that I can express. These images up here are very recent and I would uh, hope that anyone looking at them can see that they are joyful. Um, these ones are, this one is a little bit earlier. And same with these ones here. They're they're sort of like a combination of woodcut and silk screen, um, and they're they're talking about uh, you know pull push and pull of good and evil. Um, I'm not sure if you're seeing that, but so you know if you have any questions about these, uh, I'm going to scroll through to the next few pages, and uh, just so you can see all the different artwork, and then if there's questions, we can take those. So this is an example of my printmaking work but I also do a lot of drawing from life. And so here are some images that are a little bit more connected to people asking me to do something. And mostly it re um, relates to portrait work. And mostly it is pet portrait work. <laughs> so I didn't actually include, I should have put in a portrait of someone's dog, but this one is actually a, a quick pencil sketch of this little girl sitting with her dog and um, this was one of the early ones when I went to the woman who owns the gallery and I sat out on the street and sketched for people. Um, from this year where I'd made this one about four years ago to now, I like, I, I'm, I'm making a nice extra supplemental income from it and I really enjoy it and I've met all kinds of people. Um, but another thing I love to do is just uh, my boyfriend, he fishes on, uh, right across the Raritan River from New York City. And so sometimes I just like to go out in the woods or follow him where he's fishing and I'll sketch what I see. And so this is, um, I think, the Verrazano Bridge. And here are some fishermen over a dune and you can see their fishing poles. And they're just little pencil sketches. And they're really small. Like I think this one is actually like one inch by three inches wide. And the reason they're small is because I'll pack the paper and the pencils. This is a good photograph to show you scale. It's a tiny pencil nub, and those are the sketches. Um, and I tape them down to a book so that I can throw it in a bag and go hiking and then draw whatever interests me. So that's some of my drawing from life work. This is a sketch of my daughter. I have two daughters. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and on that too, um, the Molly May is your logo. Would you like to talk a little bit about Thank that? Thank you. Yes. And you know what? That was silly of me uh, because I did not include. Uh, so as a printmaker, I'm going to back up back to these. These ones are artwork that I've shown in galleries. 
Um, but I also, as a printmaker, again, with my diversity, I actually take some of the printmaking stencils and print them onto um, useful items like uh, towels that you would use in your kitchen. And it, it plays into the environmental side of me. So instead of buying a bunch of paper towels, I print on beautiful cotton towels that you can use instead. And um, the print work is pretty and fun, but uh, it's actually very functional. And that is, I created like a name for that line so that it became kind of recognizable. And that's what Molly May is about. And that's also the name for my Instagram actually is Go Molly May. Thank you for reminding me, Jocelyn. <laughs> Absolutely. And then also continuing on, um, you mentioned earlier that you met a lot of interesting people from, mm -hmm. um, from the portraits that you that you did of pets. And I think that's such an interesting thing because I, I love the idea of that, that people want to travel because they want to, they want to experience things. And with artists, they get to, they get to travel and go all over the place and meet all different people, even if they're in the same city, they're meeting people just by virtue of what they're creating. Wow, that is kind of profound. You just took me on a little journey there, Jocelyn. <laughs> but you're right. Like yeah. I sit there on the street of Manasquan, which is a tiny little town in New Jersey. And I have met people who were in Iraq fighting in the Iraq, you know, some of the wars in Iraq that one dog that I drew was a bomb sniffing dog from Iraq. And I get to hear about those stories um, or the people who immigrated from Russia. This little girl is the daughter of a Russian immigrant and I got to hear about their stories. So you're right, like um, right now in my life, I don't have a lot of extra money because I've got two girls and they're both starting school, like college. Um, but I've been able to make that happen and I have this incredibly rich life and I don't have to travel anywhere. That's, that's really great. <laughs> I'm glad you said that. Absolutely. It's something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, yeah. and I'm glad that you, you agree and that you commiserate with it because that's, that's, you know, that's like another, it's a way of forming ideas is when you, when you express it into the world, you never know if it's a, if it's, if it's a good idea or if it's a good thought until it's expressed and that's another layer of of art of is that when you express it other people can commiserate with it it's like in um when you're when you're doing research projects and and you get scholarly like you get scholars to commiserate with it now i can't remember the right word but commiserate is similar yes well right like they um to relate to it um mm -hmm. i totally get what, what you're saying and that's where for me art is therapeutic it's it's all good if that's all you want to do but to mm -hmm. me that's like stopping at 10 percent mm -hmm. so the rest of it the more important thing to me is that way of of not just you expressing it but you actually putting it out to the public mm -hmm. risk taking because you're not sure if people are going to like it or not but the more you do it you it almost becomes its own um positive high i'm going to say i don't like using that word its own mm -hmm. high but it's a very enriching experience and it's one that you start to gain confidence through putting ideas out there and mm -hmm. you start to also appreciate that whether someone likes it or not it at least creates an opportunity for dialogue and that to me is what's more important than the therapeutic part. It is inviting a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and so you might look at these and think, oh, they're pretty and they're colorful. But if you looked closely, you would see interesting little things like this weird little city that's floating around kind of topsy-turvy in this sea of crazy flowers. And so it's like, to me, it's this balance of the grit of a city to the overwhelming abundance of the world around it. And, and how narrow-minded sometimes people can be if all they think that is that the city is the only important thing. Um, so I love it and I love showing my images, even these sketches. Um, but the other thing I love is related, oops, to, I'm gonna back up, to this slide, which is this other opportunity I have to engage with people through the teaching artistry. And so all of these images relate to projects I've done 
either as a community artist, here, here is my section of that 60 foot long woodblock print that I made last summer out in Washington state. Here is me standing there inking it up so you can see how big the piece of wood is. Um, but then, uh, and this ended up like I worked with students to create this image. I carved it, but I talked to them about where they lived. They wrote haiku poetry. And that's what you see. These words are the poems that the kids wrote. So this piece was more me in terms of how the visual came out and it was inspired by their words. But in other situations as a teaching artist, the artwork produced is really all motivated by the kids. I just give them the idea. And so some of these other pieces are more like that. Um, and I've done puppetry. I've done shadow puppets. I just love that. Um, I've taught some of my printmaking to high school kids and this girl was just in love with it. She printed this cute little face all over a whole bunch of clothing and that's what she's doing there. Um, and then I've, I've had worked with really young kids too, like she was in high school, but I've also worked with kindergartners and first graders to create a mural that allows them to create a self-portrait. Um, so all of these little pictures down here are self-portraits, but I, I told them to not think of the way they physically look, but to think of the way they are emotionally. And so some of them used, really, we talked about design and how color can convey happy or, you know, frightened or timid and, and placement and size all communicates ideas. And so these kids did this great job of expressing who they are in a emotional way um, with these designs. And we pasted them all into these gigantic canvases that are now hanging in the school cafeteria. Um, and then that brings me to the opportunity where I now work with anybody who wants to participate in this project, Exquisitely Connected. And so this page has different images related to that, including some screenshots of the Instagram um, where you can see like each of what looks like a little square is actually an individual's artwork. And when they submit it, if they follow these rules up here, they're able to, no matter what they make, their piece will line up uh, with somebody that they end up randomly getting put next to on the Instagram page because of the careful measuring. So one thing I'm a big fan of, which goes right back to that architecture story, is um, the carefulness, like the the measurement, the the blend of mathematics with visual art. Um, and I think I have one more slide that just gives a plug to the partners who I worked with. And I again, being diverse, it helps me get to know a lot of people. I couldn't have done Exquisitely Connected if it were not for the, the museum out in Washington State who loved the idea as well and created the their website that um, supports the database where people submit their artwork. And then also an East Coast partner and having these two partners on the West Coast and the East Coast, it just makes the project become that much more exciting because um, you get this sense that it is a national project. And we do have artwork from all over the place. But I would love to invite anyone who's listening to submit. Um, here's the information. Um, so that's that's the end of my slideshow. Do you want me to scroll back or do you want me to stop sharing and you can ask questions? So I think, um, would you rather us just go, because we can just have a little bit of a discussion and then we'll be done with the um, stream. Okay. Um, so would you rather us be the, the little squares and the setup that we have now, or do you want to go back to the two big squares? Uh, I am not seeing you. Can you see me still? I can see you. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm okay with keeping it this way. If, if you are. Oh yeah, I'm fine. Okay. That way, so, if you have a question about any of the artwork or anything, um, there, we can get to it. Yeah, you could go back uh, to, I think it was your print. Okay. The, this um, one? Yes, the one with the red and then the tree growing out from the side. Yeah. I love that one. Thank you. So what are some inspirations behind it? And also, can you explain a little bit how printing works? Because I'm not, I'm not a visual artist in creation of art. I'm a visual artist in using a camera. 
Yes. And so I, I don't know how any of this works. I bet I could figure it out, but it would never be as good. Um, <laughs> just based on figuring it out. If, if you practiced it, I didn't, I didn't know anything about printmaking either until I was a college student. So oh. it's, it's not too late. And it's, okay. if you love it, again, it's all about being excited about it. So if you love something, you're going to just naturally do a good job at it. Mm -hmm. The but, passion. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. So the so printmaking is a technique in art just like painting is a technique in art and it some people nowadays because we have you know plug-in laser printers and all of that or even now 3d printers um they think printmaking means that i'm running this image off of a computer but that is not the case at all um, printmaking in its traditional form is a hand process. Everything about it is hand done from if it's a wood cut. So the, in this particular image that you were asking about, this includes wood cut and also silk screen. The heart, the red shape of the heart is actually a wood cut. And if you look at it, you can kind of get the feel for that because the lines in it look kind of like difficult like they weren't flowy and easy to make and that's because i'm actually gouging them into a block of wood and i'm kind of carving it as though it's a stamp and when i get the thing carved the way i want it to be i roll ink on the surface of it just like you would press a stamp into a pad of ink but in this case it's big so i'm rolling it and if you can see can you see this photo down here it's really small but it shows my hand holding a brayer, which is like a little roller with ink on it. And I'm rolling it across another image that I carved out. And um, I don't know if I can enlarge this, if I can zoom in. You could probably go and, and you could probably exit out of um, yeah. at a presentation and then uh, make the, the photo bigger by okay. clicking on it. Oh yeah. So maybe try this. Oh, is that better? Yeah, it's a lot better. Yeah, okay. So that's my hand. I'm holding a brayer. The brayer rolls ink on the surface of this thing, which I've carved mm -hmm. out. In this, in this case, this is not a block of wood. This one is a block of linoleum, but it's mm -hmm. the same idea. Um, so back to the one you're asking about. Oops. <laughs> this is going to be painful. <laughs> um, okay, here it is. <laughs> No, it's not a problem. Okay. <laughs> um, I was just, I was making my noise about how beautiful the art is. Oh, thank you. That makes me happy. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Um, so this one, you can see again, the scratchy lines. That's because, you know, depending on what kind of wood you're using, it's easier or more difficult to carve. But mm -hmm. in this case, the marks I made were perfect because this piece that you were uh, interested in looking at is about passion and and sort of struggle and mm -hmm. so if the lines on my heart were all perfect and neat and tidy i don't think that would speak as well to the idea of struggle as these mm -hmm. lines which look like i struggled to make them <laughs> and so the heart is there and it's like spurting out blood but it's healthy it's a healthy red and it's pumping so it's alive and you realize too then that the heart is sort of intertwined with these other forces of nature like a flowing river and these fish do you see the fish now mm -hmm. they're hopping in and among the waves and anchored into the heart is rooted a tree which is kind of blossoming out so the black parts the parts that are the tree and the fish and even the flowers over top that are growing on the heart those are a silk screen technique and then the heart is a woodcut technique and the waves are also a different wood carved part so, so. silk screen what does that mean how does i now i understand how you do woodcut how do you do silk screen um silk screen is i i should have thought to include like some of the tools of silk screen um i'm going to slide over to this one because these ones although they have some woodcut in them they are more silk screen mm -hmm. Um, so with silkscreen, you're the way you make you're you're actually printing from 
a stencil that is stretched onto um, a piece of fabric. It mm -hmm. used to be silk, but now it is a very high-tech polyester. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's durable. And, it, and even though it's fabric, you can staple it to a frame so that it's very tight like a drum. And mm -hmm. it, supports, uh, it supports your stencil. Um, but if you know, if you think about a stencil being like a spray paint artist, maybe holding up paper and spray painting through it, mm -hmm. um, that has to be a very simple stencil because the paper holds all of the parts. Mm -hmm. Silk green lets your stencil be way more complicated because all the threads of the fabric can support all kinds of parts of an image. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so you see these flowers here that mm -hmm. are they're kind of popping out of part of this image, which is, I'm going to zoom in, um, actually a sort of a city. I'm into this, uh, this juxtaposition of weird things like nature. Here's that. You're, you're into the next juxta juxtaposition. <laughs> there we go. It was rough. Um, <laughs> um, of nature versus um, like city. Yeah. Not, not necessarily opposing, but putting them in the same canvas. Um, compares them and contrasts them. Exactly. And because we, okay, so this gets back to something I think I wrote about in my thesis as a, as a graduate student was mm -hmm. we as human beings, we are also animals. So the mm -hmm. human animal. And so this idea that, oh, we live in houses and we have electricity, but really at heart, we come from the same earth that creates animals and not long ago we were living like hand to mouth hunting for food you know mm -hmm. so i like to sort of juxtapose in my own personal art i am interested in that juxtaposition of um of opposites maybe or contrasting mm -hmm. things so this intricate little flower pattern you can see it here you see mm -hmm. it again here you see it again in this other print um mm -hmm. that goes with it that's the cool thing about printmaking is I can create one stencil and I can use it a whole lot of different times. You can e even see it here where it looks like it's kind of part of the background, but yeah. it's really a silkscreen print um, in yeah. light blue. Yeah. That's very interesting. Um, something that I noticed was the shape of things. You have mm -hmm. very distinct shapes and you have, distinct, you have distinct colors, but I like the shapes which you have because specifically contrasting the the city in one print and the and the flower in the other they're a similar shape yeah which is an interesting contrast oh i see what you mean so like the weird little curvy surface mm -hmm. that the city sits on and the bump of, where one thing is in the middle yeah uh you're talking about this one here yeah so like that flower right there and then your city over there how they both are three things essentially and that it's a point in the middle and it, it's balanced, which is just a visually pleasing setup for any piece of art, but it's interesting contrasting them. Like when they were next to each other, it was like an over um, bearing thought of mine that they are very similarly shaped. Yeah, and I think, um, and actually they also have that similar curvy shape, mm -hmm. like the flower petals that I use a lot. And so I, I think that that, See, this is why I love making art because you look at it and you're seeing things in it that I didn't necessarily think about. But, but you it, felt it. I felt it, and mm -hmm. you're you're right on the money. And even if someone sees something completely that I never thought of and didn't even feel, mm -hmm. it's still super interesting. And of course, the more you do it, you start to be able to craft your message in a way mm -hmm. that you know it's going to be pretty close. Yeah, like um with your with your heart one that i i pinpointed on it kind of like with the tree with the roots it was like i i interpreted it as you were getting um uh brushed away in this river because it's about passion and you said you're getting brushed away in the river of passion but you're still connected to your roots of your family you're still connected to your roots of your culture yes i like it <laughs> yeah. you yeah, that's how you know you found good art is, is when it's very interpretive. Totally. And I tell my students, even though I teach art history, sometimes I also do teach studio art. And mm -hmm. um, no matter whether a student of mine is taking art history or a painting class, they get a heavy dose of the idea of interpreting and being open and how 
some mm -hmm. art lasts over millennia because it has more to say than just like, does it look pretty over my couch? <laughs> mm -hmm. Which doesn't negate the purpose of other art. Like I have um, a specific design. I love polka dots in my room. I have polka dots all over, but mm -hmm. polka dots on my, um, my bed sheets is a different thing than a polka, the polka dots on on a specific piece of art because it's just different it but it's not negating the purpose of each right and it's not discounting one over the other it's just a fact that they have different purposes yes that is true and part of the other nice thing about visuals is that they can create moods just like i was telling the young kindergartners who mm -hmm. made their emotional mural so like the sense of joy and wacky colors like this kid here, I'm going to zoom in on that one. He had this incredible story about why his picture looked the way it does. Mm. This one, do you mm -hmm. see it? So it he told me like a bird. it what? It looks a little bit like a bird. It does. Um, but he told me specifically that it's he was expressing how his older brother makes him sad sometimes. Aww. Yeah. And it wasn't because his older brother is a bully, but I, through talking to this boy, I learned that his older brother is like 13 years older than him. And the young boy is always wanting to play with his older brother, but mm -hmm. the older brother oftentimes is hanging out with his own friends of his own age. And so mm -hmm. the young boy feels sad that he doesn't, have his buddy with him more. And so he chose colors that he felt represented the the sadness, like the, the feeling of being isolated from his brother in this dark space and the way the head, he even talked about how he split the head into two different colors because sometimes he was happy and sometimes he was sad. And mm -hmm. and like the, the way that these kids were able to talk about the choices they made was incredible. Mm -hmm. that, that's extraordinary. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Yes, that's what I love about being a teaching artist. Um, yeah. Well, now we've come full circle, I guess, in a way that we, we've come back to the beauty of being a teaching artist and the beauty of, of, of passing on your, your art onto others and them reflecting art back to you. Yeah. Such a beautiful communication that comes from being a teaching artist. Totally, absolutely. So thank you so, so much for being on. This was such a great time. I mean, oh, good. I was so excited and, and, and it paid off. It was awesome. You're awesome. <laughs> oh, I love you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I'll make one more shameless plug for my Absolutely. exquisitely connected. So here is the information. <laughs> I would love and need more artwork for it. Um, I put we have the Instagram on the comments and then... Um, you, you can tell me your handle for the other one and I'll go grab that handle as well for your personal one. Oh yeah, thanks. The personal one is Go Molly May and it's okay. G-O-M-O-L-L-Y-M-A-E. Awesome. So Thank go back to your shameless plug. <laughs> uh, yeah, so my shameless plug is that um, we do have um, through Monmouth Arts and that's one of the people who I saw made a comment um, is the director of Monmouth Arts they are hosting another class where I will actually be live with you to sort of talk you through the process and some of the history that I didn't get to tell you about tonight. And we could like collectively make something together. And then whenever you're finished with it, you can upload it onto the computer, uh, onto the database. And um, that new ma next master class is October 29th at 6 p.m. Eastern time. Um, and it is open to anybody, but you do have to register because if it gets too full, we're going to have to, um, turn some people away. So you could go to this website to register for that, monmouthartsorg slash workshops and look for exquisitely connected, but well, you, don't, you don't have to do the workshop to participate. You could just make something following the rules. If you visit either website of Mary Hill Museum or Monmouth Arts, you will find exquisitely connected and it gives you the instructions. Wonderful. When um, we get off the stream, can you uh, email me those links and I can put them in the comments of this after the stream? Yes. Thank you. Good idea. Um, well, thank you so much for being on. I hope that this 
um, garnered some more people for your pro your project. Yes. And I'm very excited to see where it goes, and I'm excited to see where you go. Thanks, and I'm excited to see where you go. You you've got a whole life ahead of you, and good for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone, for staying on. Um, be sure to check out Exquisitely Connected. Be sure to check out uh, Molly on her personal Instagram. And um, thank you. And just stay safe. Yes. Agreed. Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Did that Have work? a great night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>